welcome to Value-Based Care Insights, brought to you by Illumina Health Partners, a national healthcare consulting firm focused on improving the strategic, financial, and operational performance of provider organizations. On this program, we will explore trends and share valuable insights on how health systems and medical groups can optimize their performance to meet the demands of this increasingly complex healthcare environment and shift to transform the delivery of care. Value-Based Care Insights is hosted by Daniel Marino, managing partner of Lumina Health Partners. Daniel has been in the industry for over three decades and specializes in shaping strategic initiatives for organizations in areas such as population health, clinical integration, physician alignment, information technology, and data analytics. For additional insights, visit luminahp.com and sign up for our newsletter. Dan, over to you. As more healthcare providers, as more hospitals and health systems transition into value-based care, particularly the contracting side um, of value-based care, there's a progression of contracts and organizations go through a progression um, of maybe moving into performance-based contracts and then moving into shared savings contracts and then eventually moving into risk-based contracts. Um, on this program, we've talked about risk-based contracts a number of times. It's an area that I think is um, both interesting and challenging for providers. Many providers, many hospitals, health systems, as I'm talking with them around the country, they often say, well, I, I don't know if I'm ready to get into risk yet. Um, and frankly, I don't know even if I can succeed into risk. But as organizations are moving into risk-based contracts, there's a progression into capitation or fully capitated type levels of reimbursement, which is structured around a PMPM. And, and again, there's it's a journey as you start to build those capabilities to drive that success. There are a number of elements that go into it as, as, you know, as we've discussed, changing the care model, putting in place strong care management, looking at the performance analytics to, to drive a lot of the successes around managing the population in a capitated environment. Well, I'm very excited today to have as my guest, Lynn Carroll. Lynn is the COO and head of strategies for HS Blocks. HS Blocks provides a lot of uh, business support and, and, and a payment business or analytics platform that helps organizations drive success around capitation. And he wrote a really good article that, that really caught my attention called Why Capitation Contracts Can Benefit Providers, Payers, and patients. We'll put a link to that um, in our notes. Lynn, welcome to the program. Dan, it's great to be here. Uh, one of my favorite topics, so I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, I, I, I appreciate it. Um, so Lynn, let's, let's jump right into this. What are you seeing around the types of capitation contracts that providers are getting into, um, both in terms of uh, the payer structures and maybe what payer or what providers are struggling with or challenged with as they enter into some of these capitation arrangements? Sure, Dan. In, in our business, uh, we have kind of seen, uh, a, a, as you mentioned in the, your opening comments, sort of a progression from some more traditional pay for performance, pay for quality type programs. And certainly we in our business see a lot of MSSP, and then now we're seeing some more ACO reach uh, types of programs out there. We have also seen uh, programs taking hold in uh, the commercial uh, uh, arena as well. But um, a lot of the programs kind of fit these characteristics. That First of all, they all have some type of a quality component right. uh, in, in the programs. Uh, but they are typically defined uh, sets of services for a defined population with some type of a fixed either per head or percentage of premium type of a model. Right. So that's kind of like a PMPM type of a reimbursement structure. Sure. Sure. A per head uh, at a fixed sort of a rate or a percentage of the premium for a okay. completely go global type of, a, of an approach. Um, some of the programs will also incorporate um, on the risk bearer side uh, where there will be some sub caps uh, sure. going on. 
uh, to sort of delegate some portions of the risk uh, downstream. So let's dive into that a little bit. When you say subcaps, what do you mean? So typically, might carve out uh, some piece of the pie underneath uh, a global capitation model. So okay. if there's a percentage of premium, there might be a PCP cap underneath it. There might also be some elements of uh, either bundling or episodic types of reimbursement to sure. try to manage uh, the overall cost structures underneath the programs. Um, and then we'll also see um, and have seen programs, and you probably read about one almost every day, where folks are contemplating different types of carve-out yeah. uh, scenarios, which would be either, you know, chronic kidney disease certainly mm-hmm. comes to mind, MSK, uh, and other programs where there's a defined set of services and a need to create some type of a coordination mechanism between more specialty and primary care to address uh, trying to find the right care path sooner in the continuum uh, to make sure that the diagnosis is correct. Uh, We see that happen also in scenarios where there may be polychronic uh, parts of the population to make sure that there's alignment between uh, primary care and specialists, for example. Are you seeing that more so in the specialty areas where particularly high cost services are occurring? So maybe yes. that, you know, Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. and then uh, because of uh, COVID-19, there has been a renewed emphasis also on, you know, mental, uh, medical and uh, social uh, mm-hmm. areas. And so we've seen some emphasis in some of the behavioral health areas as well. Um, just to try to bring in different models. Um, wow, that's interesting because tying the behavioral health piece into a capitation type of a structure, <laughs> I think it's got to be a really big, a big challenge. You can see the medical side on that, but the behavioral health piece has got to be really tougher for providers to assume a level of responsibility. Well, so it's interesting, right? Because if you look at a global reimbursement scenario, one of the first things that you want to be able to do is where are parts of expenditure that could potentially yep. be capitated in a sub model, right? And so you start to carve out different scenarios. Um, and we've seen uh, things getting folded in under the, the more global programs. And so when you're talking like, for example, total cost of care percentage of premium scenarios, you're going to see uh, different po- pods or pockets underneath those programs start to get capitated as well. Oh, yeah. uh, so that you can fix uh, the cost that you're at risk for. Well, and, and we've worked with ner- numerous um, organizations and, and clinical service lines or specialty providers where, you know, you look at cardiology or you look at orthopedics or you look sure. at neurosciences, the cost of care is different, right? So you can create some episode-based pricing models and then negotiate those structures around that. But I guess I've always kind of struggled with how then you would pull that into some type of a capitation PM PM structure, right? Because you're not necessarily managing the primary care piece of that if you're, say, an orthopod per se, or even maybe a cardiologist, you would if there's, you know, you have some patients who are seeing their cardiologist as more of their primary care physician, um, but pure specialists, I think it becomes difficult. H- how are you, how are you seeing those structured? Yeah, so I think what we have typically seen is scenarios to make sure that if there's a global risk component, the uh, stratification of the population identifies where uh, there are high touch, high need uh, patients, as well as who are sort of low touch, low need patients, and then trying to address. Uh, where there may be high touch needs, um, you know, what are the, uh, what is sort of the bucket of services? Mm-hmm. And are there ways to control the cost of those services? And I think probably as you've it's seen pretty, pretty closely in your work, that the uh, network driven components start to get narrowed. They do. Yep. They start to get narrowed. Uh, the the question starts to become, well, what's in it for the patient? And when you start to take a look at 
um, reduce choice, there has to be a value proposition from a care coordination standpoint to make sure that those care transitions across different types of needs, medical, behavioral, and social are met. Uh, otherwise, um, it, one of the tenets we typically say is that for value-based contracting, the patient's your best partner. Yeah. And I, th- I think what we mean by that is that you have to consider uh, the holistic view of what's going to happen underneath global types of programs to see if you can create some kind of synergistic alignment from the care coordination patient experience side of things right. rather than taking sort of a more traditional approach to say, you know, I'm going to limit uh, utilization or I'm going to attack length of stay for, you know, inpatient. And right. Because that, that'll right. never, that'll never yeah. work. You're going to get, you're going to get pushback. And right. As I've often said in a lot of the presentations and the models that, you know, discussions I've had with physicians, a big difference between capitation these days and capitations of the 90s, right? And um, certainly I, I lived a lot of, through there as I was managing practices. Quality wasn't a component of, right. of the 90s capitation. So it, it seems to me in in the discussion, there's really three areas that become really critical as you're starting to think about capitation type of, of models. I think one is understanding the risk of the population. Two, what's the utilization trends and really making sure that you're managing the the out migration right or or maximize your domestic utilization right. and then third to that is what are your performance outcomes look like of your of your network yeah so it's uh, definitely the case and so as we've kind of alluded to in some of the discussion so far um this you know concept notion or approach of pcp uh, or primary care and specialty alignment becomes an important part of avoiding sort of the unnecessary spending side of things mm-hmm. and trying to see if you can get a hold on duplicative services. And it's easier said than done. Okay. Yeah. Um, but essentially, you have to look at uh, the network structure, who's participating. Um, and look at trying to control things so that you can gain market share by, you know, keeping folks in-house um, and sort of reducing that leakage uh, component that then improves a couple of things. It improves uh, care coordination for the right. patient. And it also addresses those quality opportunities uh, that we're sort of talking about. Um, and the the use of, you know, looking at the referral patterns and high value uh, pro- provision of services is a big component to that. Oh yeah. Oh and, yeah. And and part of that is sort of stratifying patients to know who are the high need, high touch folks. And when we kind of think about high touch, these may be patients that need, you know, as much as a daily interaction right. and that gets into sort of a more care navigation sort right. of component. Well these become the the patients who are the more complicated patients and patients who absolutely, you know, they need that care. If you're just tuning in, I am Daniel Marino. You're listening to Value-Based Care Insights. I'm here today talking to Lynn Carroll. Lynn is the COO of HS Blocks. Um, fascinating discussion on understanding capitation contracts and what drives their success. Lynn, as, let me ask you a question, though, um, you put a, there was an interesting quote that caught my attention in your article, and it was around incentives um, and creating the right incentives. And, and one of the things that I've, I've talked about many times on the program and, and a lot of the work that I've done in helping organizations kind of advance their, their clinical integration capabilities, if you will, is you need to have the right level of incentives um, I want to I want to read this quote real quick and then ask you a question around there. But the quote is: "These newer capitation models are designed to better align incentives between primary care providers and specialists. But if the specialty care under value based or fixed price type program isn't harmonized with primary care providers, may fail to meet the cost containment or the program goals." Um, in order to reduce unnecessary or duplicative services. 
an interesting statement. I think nobody would argue with the fact that that alignment has to occur. What have you seen in terms of the solutions um, around these types of capitation models that does begin to align primary care and specialists? Yeah, so, you know, I think a, a big portion of this sort of gets into the care coordination aspect of things and uh, an emphasis on the care management pieces. So you think about the transitions in care uh, that occur, primary care can't go it alone, right? Right, so they can't. If you have a quarterback, if you will, and a primary care physician, and you have a polychronic individual, uh, effectively, a significant amount of the care is actually being managed by multiple specialists sure. in a number of those cases, which can do a couple things. One, it can create a poor patient experience. Two, it can also um, result in unnecessary leakage. And sort of the third part of it is that when you look at uh, how the interactions occur, you can uh, have a lack of visibility between what I would call different pods. Absolutely. And I, I think that's an interesting point because physicians undoubtedly do a great job of managing patients that are sort of within their within their realm, right? Within their four walls. And especially sure. if you've got a complex patient who is seeing multiple different specialists, it's hard to understand what each of the specialists are doing and how do you coordinate that care longitudinally around that whole care plan for the patient. Right. So what we see sometimes happen is in a polychronic uh, scenario, uh, let's say a patient is quote unquote enrolled into a particular program. And let's say uh, it's, you know, either a diabetic program or it's a COPD program or something. Well, um, sometimes they will be assigned into, you know, a care management path and in that care management path, the care manager or care coordination component may be unaware that they just had an admission last week. Sure. Yeah. And so part of this is sort of understanding how you're going to share data effectively for those uh, in, important and sentinel types of events. So if, for example, you have a polychronic patient and they may be actually enrolled in three different you know, uh, programs, uh, th those programs can't be siloed in nature. Yeah. And so this, and you mentioned it yourself, this longitudinal view of who all is involved in seeing this patient today and uh, what's going on uh, across the continuum of services they may be procuring because the uh, what we have seen is a need to, if you have a, a value-based program that's uh, got a significant cohort to it, you're going to have uh, polychronic individuals that you need yeah. to share information on. Yeah. And that information sharing piece is really what you're going to be talking about in terms of a care team that needs to be informed of what's happening when they're not the ones seeing the patient. Well, so... Just building on then, I think, you know, that's, I think that's really the key point. So if you're going to start to align primary care and specialists and even specialists and the subspecialists, what an important element of success, at least in my mind, is that you need to have the right level of data. You need to be able to share that data with the different providers and with their respective care teams and then have sort of an oversight care management individual, and maybe this is, you know, with input of the primary care physician, to really allow um, the quarterbacking of that care, right? So maybe, and influencing it. So you're never going to tell a provider what they need to do, but you should be able to influence what they provide to that patient. So it does meet the objectives, both for that patient and for the performance outcomes related to that patient in that contract. Yeah, that's right, because you have to kind of understand um, where are referrals going, right? Well, and, yeah. And part of this is, you know, 
if you're taking risk, um, you want to manage sort of that leakage component to make sure. And there's also a market share component too. Well, right? it is. Yeah. That because is- leakage, I'll tell you, you know, from the analysis that we've done, leakage is the biggest cost driver. Leakage and, you know, redundancy of, of care services. But, you know, um, one of the things when we've done some analysis, and I'll be interested in hearing your thoughts on this, we've actually advised providers not to necessarily get involved in capitation contracts until their leakage is really less than 10%. Because if it's more than that, one, you don't have the ability to, to, to manage, do, to proactively manage the patients appropriately to, to drive the contract performance. But second, and probably more important, you're adding an extra layer of costs onto your care model that you're responsible for. Right. And, and I'm not sure you can be successful. Are, are you seeing the same thing? Yeah. So sort of along those same lines, you have uh, the scenarios where, um, and, and I think some of the documentation out there will sh- say things like uh, in a hospital system, for example, they may experience as much as, you know, 30 or 50 percent leakage, for example. Right. And, you know, a good goal sort of is, hey, you know, let's try to keep in-house, uh, you know, or reduce that leakage by anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of that number type of scenario. Well, you know, what you just said is let's get it even further down, right? Right. In that particular scenario. And part of this, too, is is looking at, well, what what can also help drive that? And part of that is, again, well, what's in it for the patient? Right. Yeah, right. Because, Why do they need to do it? What's the right level incentives? And also to, you know, I, I want to be sensitive as well to the market, you know, in a rural community, um, they may have 95% of the patients go into one facility. So their leakage is three to 5% sure. in a metropolitan area where you have a little bit more competition, you know, maybe 20% is as good as you can get because, right of the level of competition. But I think to really focus on that and to have um, a a pretty uh, prescribed approach to how you're managing and steering the patients, particularly those that are high cost, um, you know, you you need to have that as part of your care model and your care management approach. Otherwise, I think you're really vulnerable. Well, I think that's a good point. And I think, uh, you know, from a pure patient perspective too, um, is the benefit design uh, that a patient is under, you know, depending upon what type of a program or, or what type of coverage they have, is that benefit design going to be, you know, congruent with the program design? Yeah, so, good point. Yeah. So one of the things that we have seen, you know, and this probably is a little bit more relevant, probably in some of the more commercial side of things, but is, you know, let's say, I have a high deductible uh, program as a uh, uh, plan as a patient and I have a significant out-of-pocket cost. And yet from uh, a, you know, value-based program scenario, if I'm in a value-based cohort, um, the question for a provider is, well, there's still a large uh, financial collection from the patient. And yet I'm responsible for an outcome that I have a fixed you know, uh, revenue stream on. And from the flip side of that scenario is the patient saying, well, if you're going to reduce my choice or narrow my set of choices, why do I have any out-of-pocket cost? Well, and like you said, you've got to be able to show to patients because at the end of the day, patients are going to have decisions. You've got to show the patient what's in it, what's in it for them. Well, Lynn, this has been great. And I know, you know, many providers, um, many of our listeners for that matter, are are really given a lot of consideration to moving into capitation arrangements. And I think as folks become more proficient and successful under these risk-based contracts, moving into global cap is the next step. Yep. Real quick, if you were able to give 30-second piece of advice to our listeners who are interested in, in maybe entertaining or considering moving into a capitation-based model, what would it be? Well, I think the first thing certainly is if you're taking risk, know what you're taking risk on. Yeah. And, and that that means you, you definitely have to look from a population health perspective to know of the cohort that's you're suggested yeah. to take risk or considering taking risk on, you know, what's in there. 
Right, um, managing so, the data and understanding it. Yep, and, and sometimes that's a challenge, right? Sure. Which is, you know, uh, say a proposal comes in or you're holding up your hand even and saying, I want to take risk. Uh, you better know who you're taking it on. Uh, yeah. So from that perspective, you need to have the data to be able to kind of stratify that population. And again, kind of group it into those buckets of, you know, who's high touch, high need yeah. uh, and who are, you know, lower need, lower touch types of scenarios so that you can put in the care coordination as well as data yeah. sharing pieces that are necessary for success. Well, I think the data is absolutely key as well as understanding the different aspects of the population. I would also add understanding what's occurring with your participating providers, you know, their yes. plans and, and so forth. Where well, are the referrals going a, today? Right. Absolutely. A, a great discussion. Fascinating. I commend you on the work that you're doing. And, um, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's great. Um, if any of our listeners are interested in getting in touch with you or learning a little bit more about maybe some of, of your services or just, sort of connecting with you and, and your article, how can they get a hold of you? So uh, we always encourage folks to go to our website, hsblocks.com. Uh, we have a good, lot of good content out there. We have a series of two-minute videos where you can learn more about what we do. Um, it's always an important uh, aspect of kind of entertaining dialogue with folks. If they can take a quick look at a two-minute video, it tends to kind of set up the discussion pretty good. Yep. Um, also, we tend to publish a lot on LinkedIn as well yeah, uh, about v VBC developments and what's happening. Wonderful. Well, thanks again, Lynn. Fascinating discussion. Um, and, you know, obviously we'll we'll keep this going because uh, an area, again, I, I see this as kind of the future. So thanks again for coming on the program. Yeah, it's great to be here, Dan. Thank you so much. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in today to Value-Based Care Insights. Until the next insight, I am Daniel Marino, bringing you 30 minutes of value to your day. Take care. Are you at a crossroad with Value-Based Care? Do you need to chart a future strategy or improve your organizational performance? Visit us at LuminaHP.com to learn more about our consulting services and leadership development programs. Also, you can sign up for our newsletter on our website and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. For more information about value-based care insights, visit the program's page on healthcareradionow.com or LuminaHP.com. Join the conversation using our hashtag VBC Insights. We are Lumina Health Partners. Thank you for joining us today. Until the next value-based care insight, stay well.